So I know St Nicholas, but that's almost it. And I don't know why he's St Nicholas. Is it no boxes under the cassocks? Auxerre in central France. Possibly the nicest city you've never heard of. So many churches and cathedrals, so little time seems appropriate. I know many of you may have had vacations using a similar phrase in a slightly different way, perhaps Miami or something. But many of us enjoy having a little poke around a church or a cathedral when we're in a town. A lot of people like to plan according to visiting a particular type of cathedral. It's perfectly understandable. There's an awful lot of workmanship goes into them. Whether you can say that you like the story behind the cathedrals, I'm not too sure. They're all such brutal stories, aren't they? No. The beheading of John the Baptist. I mean, I've heard of John the Baptist before, but I never knew he was beheaded. Obviously, with any saint, there's going to be lots of churches that claim to have parts of his anatomy amongst their relics. Some more plausible than others, that fingers that plunged Jesus into the sea for the baptism. But who's got the head most plausibly? Appreciation of the architectural styles must be a bigger thing these days than pilgrimages to the relics, though, I think. From my university architecture history studies, part of the course, Chartres and its intestines like uh, floor, entrance and vestibule thing was one of the most important ones in terms of the development of particular styles and what was influencing uh, British architecture. Fair chance it was the same workman. Germanus of Auxerre was a early missionary to Britain from what was still almost essentially the Roman world of Christendom. I was sharing with you how Lyon on the River Rhone was the centre for the three Gauls for the Romans. The three Gauls, there was only one, France. It was in that early Roman Christian crossover period that the Egyptian who was to become Saint Maurice was summoned towards Auxerre by the Roman commanders. Fairly unusual for Egypt, but not for Roman Egypt of the time. Um, he was a Christian and he'd um, got together his legion as he was promoted, and it consisted mainly of Christians. Nepotism, no surprise there in the fall of Rome period. Rome wouldn't usually get neighbour to fight neighbour, so from one end of the empire to the other, pretty much. And they got this Maurice fellow and his legion to clear the path over the San Bernardino Pass, the Col San Bernard, over the Alps. So, I'm sorry, I don't know whether they were clearing rocks off a sort of a track, sort of building a bit of a road, I think. I don't know if they were clearing snow, sorry. But you've been brought a long way and you're up in the, from a hot place to a cold place up in the Alps mountains. You're not going to be, might be feeling a little bit defiant. But when he was to become Saint Maurice, was ordered to kill a load of Christians, local French Christians, he refused. It'll be no surprise to you that he was martyred. We're a long way from the Alps though, and while Borg Saint Maurice in the Alps is very local to where I live, on the Isère River, the city of Auxerre on the Yonne River is on the furthest extremities west of the Burgundy region. I'm sure Chablis wine was popular and brought in a fair amount of scudo back then, but in that period, between 400 and 1,000 years, theological argument and a centre for learning more generally, and even hospital, sort of, was what Auxerre was known for. And the saint the church or cathedral is named after now isn't necessarily how it started off. The cathedral of The saint that a church or a cathedral is named after now isn't necessarily how it started off. The cathedral of St Etienne, 11th century, the 10 hundreds, has its very early Romanesque cathedral, 
remains under the Gothic style, down in the crypt. But it was the Abbey of Saint-Germain in Auxerre that existed from the 800s. That crypt has some of the oldest mural paintings in France, and the tombs of the bishops of Auxerre, one of whom, who got the job and got the cathedral, by putting up much of the money himself and setting a good example. He did this in other towns as well. Once you've got that flagship, it's much easier to get the rest of the investment. The Pope, in Rome, was installing the primates of Gaul. And the primates of France is something that's stuck to this day, as a prestige religious title. There's a drama or two, a box set or two, of um, the Knights Templar. Not so much about the Knights Hospitaller, but they were just as an important parallel group of knights. I'd never heard of these when I started my architecture course, but of course, during the Crusades, they were able to inspire donations from the feudal lords and the kings throughout Europe to go and claim the Holy Land for Christendom. Byzantium and the Ottomans had something to say about this. They managed to... this, they managed to get back their traditional lands. And over the centuries, a sort of hypocrisy agreement of trade, a sort of entente cordiale, possibly, grew up between the courts of Europe and the Ottoman Empire. The Knights Templar, which had been amazing at setting up banks so that a crusading knight could deposit some money, money in Paris, perhaps. France was big for the centuries during the crusading era and beyond. And then that same knight could then withdraw the deposited money, just like a bank pretty much, but in Jerusalem or any number of Templar places. The knights of Hospitaller, as they've always been known to me, slightly different. They tended to concentrate initially on the very important healthcare-like services and hospital which came in increasing demand as the Crusades started to fail. As the Crusades failed, the contributions from the ports of Europe tended to dwindle, rather than the other way round. These Knights Hospitaller, which are more commonly known as the Knights of St John. St John the Baptist, who was a sort of forerunner of Jesus, I read something about his cousin, he wasn't really his cousin, was John the Baptist the real deal, and Jesus was the copycat band, the tribute band. I'm sure for some schools of theological thought that call themselves religions, I've just committed a mortal sin. I'll put myself forward as a martyr for sanity and reason. Reason may be a short-term highest achievement of the entire universe, according to the gospel of Professor Cox. No. taken vows and they're committed to a simple life. The Abbey, one of the centres of learning, there is in Paris a spin-off cathedral of St John of Auxerre, which was eventually to give rise to the University of St John in Paris. With their initial reason for being sort of fallen by the wayside, they weren't, these Knights of St John weren't off to the Holy Land anymore. They found a new purpose in sailing the Mediterranean, sort of policing it. This is a type of policing that Americans might be more familiar with. The Knights of St John were given powers by the European powers to stop and search any Ottoman Turkish vessel, vessel or ship, any ship really, that they considered might be carrying Turkish goods of any type. This is in the days of the Barbary pirates, the... Ottoman Corsairs. The Knights of St John were the early privateers of the Mediterranean. With the dwindling charity contributions from the European governments, times were hard. They had huge amounts of property and islands of Malta and roads to maintain, and this just didn't come cheap. The Knights of St John wrote a begging letter to the French king. It said how some upstart Protestants in German sort of area had captured some of their things, and it's only the Spanish and the French that are now making any real contributions to our cause. 
the Knights of St. John were a very useful professional body of sailors that could be used in the French Navy. Over time, it was only really through them that the French Navy was able to hold its own amongst the Spain and the Portugal-Holland family alliance. And good old Elizabeth I and Henry before him with his eight wives in ambition, the eight priors that ministered the eight tongues of Europe that made up the order of St. John were getting increasingly dominated by the French. Lang. And these more or less monastic knights of St. John were becoming increasingly decadent, much more like sailors letting themselves loose in every port. Their great wealth was getting squandered on wine, women and song, and their stop-and-search policy was really getting stretched to the thinnest of excuses. Culturally, the mausoleum of Moore, the guy that gave us the word mausoleum, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, was pulled down to strengthen their ramparts. Tangible defence point. Podrum. The moral decline of the knights and going off to serve in foreign navies. The mercenary sea dogs of the 1300s to the 1600s, divorced from their cardinal reason for existence. Inflated with wealth, laden with privileges, which gave them almost sovereign powers, the Order of St John at last became so demoralised with luxury and idleness that it forgot the aim for which it was founded, and gave itself up for the love of gain and thirst for pleasure. Its covetousness and pride soon became boundless. The knights pretended that they were above the reach of crowned heads and nation-states they seized and pillaged without concern of the property of both infidels and Christians. The Knights of St. John's exploits grew in fame and wealth. The complacent European states that no longer contributed to keep order in the Mediterranean meant that the order's raids had to increase, and it was the captured merchants and crew that they could enslave and kidnap for extortionate ransoms that brought the most income. Architecturally, Vista has always meant to me a good view, to be designed in, but Vista was originally the name for the stop-and-search policy. Over-eager, many nations suffered, and they started to turn on the Knights of St John. The rampant overindulgence of privateering in the Mediterranean, they were no longer the military outpost of a united Christendom. It just became another nation-state in a commercially orientated continent, soon to be overtaken by the trading nations of the North Sea, the Dutch and the British. British dissolution of the monasteries and later Napoleon and his expansions confiscated from the order of Hospitaller St John so that it became almost a relic of itself and a symbol more than a sign. The eight-pointed cross, the Maltese cross, white on black, and the white cross on a red background, just like the Savoir flag. The symbols and the terminologies like Grandmaster are still proudly used by some that want to hark back to a unified authority. These are establishment figures that have little more ethics than Jack Sparrow and his dad, the privateer pirates. But we're visiting Auxerre and St Etienne that is relevant St Stephen, but also there's a place of St Nicholas, St Nicholas Square. It would be a good time to visit there. The long, low winter sun looks beautiful, all the town reflecting in the water of the river Yon. So we, can we go back to this John fella for a minute, this prototype Jesus, who was supposed to baptise with fire as well. Walking around wearing camel hair and living off locusts and wild honey. But this John that these knights, Hospitaller, had such a high opinion of, it seems like he might have been a bit of a YouTuber of his day or something. How his death came about. Perhaps a bit of a gossip columnist or something. Reality TV star. So John rebuked Herod for marrying the ex-wife of his brother. How his brother came to be deceased. Dancing for her husband, Herod. Dancing. Herod.
friends, please. He offers her anything she could possibly want in return for the dancing. So she has to go to her mummy and say, what do I actually want, mummy? And mummy says, as you would, I want the head of John the Baptist that said something about my match. So reluctantly, the lusty Herod orders the beheading of this righteous and holy podcast if he likes. John's subscribers or followers take his body and bury it to the tomb. I thought it was supposed to be shoved over the city wall, actually. I'm doing a bit of bit theory research to see if I visited the cathedral that's got the blue head of John. But all I can see really is that it's pretty stumped and the next black that comes along. But my investigations have led me to Damascus, Syria, where the head of who was to become a Muslim prophet is happily resting, with its eyes closed on a gold halo-like plate in the way out of Moscow. San Silvestro in Rome. Either way, you've really got a question of religion that's so obsessed about merch, merchandising, or perhaps I could just see the value of a potential antique straight from the off, the same that we've sort of thought about. That phone, I'm going to keep it, it's going to be an antique one day. Salacious story that it is, I think it's more likely that John was going to be able to raise a rebellion against Herod. And the one was spending it forward, and the other was paying it forward. So I know St Nicholas, but that's almost it. And I don't know why he's St Nicholas. Is it no boxes under the cassocks? I've found plenty of references to obscure purposes for the saints, but not so many of their actual stories, like often brutal and bizarre creation myths. There's St Servetus, 4th century Armenian, who died in Maastricht in the Netherlands of an infection of a leg wound. So as well as the city of Maastricht, centre of Europe. Any pilgrimage for leg disorder of any type, foot, rheumatism, protection against rats and mice, you should pray or make pilgrimage to St Servetus rather than call the local pest control. St Vedast is the patron saint of children who are late learning to walk. St Rita. Despite wanting to be a nun, St Rita's parents forced her to marry when she was about 12. Through her husband, she became embroiled in a bitter feud between two local families. The feud eventually led to her husband's murder and the deaths of both her sons. Because of her lifetime of disappointments, difficulty and setbacks, Rita is now considered to be the patron saint of the impossible. So, the saint of miracles themselves. St Gumarus of Belgium was an 8th century figure whose wife, a local noblewoman named Gunimari, was known for her both shrewish and her abusive behaviour. Despite Gomorrah's attempts to salvage their relationship, they separated and he went on to found an abbey in Lear and became the patron saint of difficult marriages. We're getting closer to Christmas, aren't we? St Lidwina fell while ice skating at the age of 15 and never fully recovered from her injuries. After a life of piety, her grave became a site of pilgrimage. After her canonisation, she became the patron saint of ice skaters. Is it going to be a white Christmas? Well, perhaps light a candle for St Medard of Picardy, patron saint of protection against bad weather. When he was an infant, an eagle flew above him during a storm to shelter him from the rain. According to folklore, whatever the weather, on St Medard's day, June the 8th, you can expect the weather to remain the same for the next 40 days, which would take us into St Januarius. Amongst the many relics, in churches from the saints, a vial of blood belonging to St Januarius, a third century bishop of Naples, was saved after his death in 305. The blood performs a long-standing miracle. Despite its age, it liquefies on three dates in the year, September 19th and 16th of December, and Saturday before their first Sunday in May. For that reason, patron saint of blood banks but far more bloodthirsty, and you may think that this might be the patron saint of hospices, or hostelries, hotels, or hospitals. St Julian the Hospitaller, this is the Knights of St John, opened a hostel for travellers and dedicated his life to providing hospitality for the sick and needy, but only after he'd killed his parents in a twist on the story of Oedipus, 
He became the patron saint of murderers, amongst other things. He'd essentially run away, and a long time he had nothing to do with his parents. He married and set up a home with his wife. His parents tracked him down in their older years, and his wife greeted them when he was out on a business trip. And he, she was so accommodating. She took the spare room and gave the parents, the parents-in-law, a marital bed. Quite a comfort, it's understandable, but then... St. Julian came home in the dark. We've all done it. Tried to get into bed. There's someone else in there. If you've ever stayed in a backpacker hostel or a train and not wanted to disturb the others, he found someone in bed with his wife. And what perhaps St. Julian had as some sort of saintly voice in his head was, well, murder the two of them. Après, on turning on the lights, he killed his parents. His wife eventually got over the fact that he was quite so amenable to killing her and she helped him repent forevermore. I think it should be the wife that's the saint. St. Drogo was afflicted by a mystery ailment that made him physically repulsive. He's now considered the patron saint of unattractive people. Entirely unrelated, he's the patron saint of coffee houses. Surely public houses would have been better. Lots of alcohol and you know where I'm going with that. Edinburgh in Scotland, a good city for a Christmas or New Year break. Adopted by the city as such, St Giles is the patron saint of breastfeeding. What could be more lovely for a nativity to see at Christmas? Nativity. I think I made a Freudian slip there. St Giles is said to have lived as a hermit in the south of France in the 7th century, nourishing himself only on the milk of a female deer. Not deer, darling, my love, but hind or heart, fast of flight and strong of kick. Perhaps he dazzled her with his halo, like car lights. Longevity of the relationship, but the intimate milking process, probably the extent of the nurture and suckling exchange, perhaps saving her from a royal hunt. Back to the nativity, St. Balthazar. Medieval tradition has it that the three kings who visited Jesus in the stable came from all corners of the medieval world. Balthazar held from Africa frequently Egypt. At the time, Romani card sharps and sideshow sleight-of-hand merchants were popular entertainers across Europe. Because it was mistakenly believed that they came from Egypt, hence gypsies, the Egyptian king St. Balthasar came to be the playing cards saint. No, not Hell's Angels, St. Columbanus spent much of the 6th and 7th century roaming around Europe, and that love of the open road has led him to be considered the patron saint of motorcyclists. Specifically Siena, San Bernardino, well known for his crowd-pleasing public preaching, is considered to be the patron saint of advertising and public relations. Of personal interest to me, St. Adjutor. He's an escaped Muslim captures in the First Crusade, and escaped by swimming, possibly to Cyprus, or just a crusader territory, perhaps all the way to the French enclave, and was transported back to France by Mary Magdalene. Perhaps it was the name of a boat, or else calmed a whirlpool that was emerged beside the boat he was travelling on. He's considered the patron saint of swimmers and those in danger of drowning. You'd think scuba as well, wouldn't you? But settle back, there's 10,000 saints in 2,000 years, a lot of miracles. And you can be venerated unofficially. St Rita became a non-virginal nun with two children after ending a family feud and lots of piety. St Elmo's fire, an uh, angel freed him from prison. He did some baptising. Romans didn't like the baptising either. So he was rolled down a hill in a barrel full of spikes, which he survived. And good, the emperor tortured him, as was the fashion. Whipped, coated in pitch, set alight, which he also survived. Pitch, you just couldn't get the good stuff in the Roman days. Should have gone for naphtha, like they've got in Iraq. After escaping it again, Recaptured and tortured, he died after having his abdomen slit open and his intestines wound around a windlass. As you'll see in any iconography of him, he's a patron saint of sailors, electrical charges at mastheads of ships. This Saint Erasmus, also patron saint of stomach aches, stomach ailments and labour pains. Saint Denis, the 3rd century Paris bishop that with two helpers converted lots of pagans to Christianity. Pagan leaders were not happy with the number of pagan followers that were dropping and alerted the Roman authorities, naturally enough. Dennis and his fellow missionaries were imprisoned for a long period of time before being beheaded on the hill that is now known as Montmartre 
After he was beheaded with a sword, it is said that the body picked up his own head and walked for a few miles. While walking, the head preached a sermon the entire way before dropping dead at the site that developed into the present-day basilica of Saint-Denis. His walk after death made him the most famous cephalophore in Christian legend, patron saint of headaches. Not canonised, but obviously should have patron saint of gender fluid people, um, facial hair, Will Fortis, not officially recognised. She is still venerated by many. Another case of her parents forcing the daughters to marry. Will Fortis' father promised her to a Moorish king, an, an Arab, to escape the unwanted marriage. The teenage took a vow of virginity and prayed to God to make her repulsive. As an answer to her prayers, she sprouted a full beard, which ended the engagement. Enraged, her father crucified her. After death, she became venerated as a folk saint, especially by women, seeking to be disencumbered from abusive husbands. It would just be too depressing to write her up as the patron saint of those vulnerable to honour killings. That oxymoron. Church leaders ordered to turn over all the riches of the church to Roman authorities before they were executed. St. Lawrence asked for three days to gather everything up, make sure he got everything. He obviously distributed the riches to the poor instead, and after three days he presented the city's poor as the treasures of the church, along with widows and consecrated virgins as the precious crown. This angered the prefect, and he ordered Lawrence to be cooked to death on a gridiron. St. Lawrence, after suffering for a long time, famously exclaimed, I'm well done on this side, turn me over! This humorous last words that we'd all aspire to led to his veneration as the saint of cooks, chefs and comedians. My spiritual father. St. Apollonia was tortured to death by a mob in Alexandria, Egypt. A prophesied calamity. Naturally, turn on the Christians, frenziedly. This virgin deaconess of the church was seized and had all her teeth pulled out or shattered. When her chastity was threatened, she jumped into the fire that a mob had prepared for her death. Even though suicide is considered a sin, virgin martyrs of the time, like Apollonia, were honoured for protecting their vows and staying true to the church. Apollonia thus became the patron saint of toothaches and dentists, as well as assuming the role of the tooth fairy in some parts of Italy. Known as the last scholar of the ancient world, Saint Isidore lived during a time of violence, widespread illiteracy and cultural disintegration. When he served as an archbishop in Seville, Spain, he was instrumental in the assimilation of the different barbarian cultures into the Visigoth kingdom, looking to foster the spiritual and material welfare of the people. His strongly religious leadership led to the conversion of many to Catholicism and he fostered education amongst the people by introducing them to philosophers such as Aristotle, a prolific writer. Isidore started an encyclopedia, patron saint of students, computer users, computer technicians, programmers, the internet. Because you use the internet as an encyclopedia of universal knowledge, don't you? Or more outdated, archaic thoughts like him for use of the comma, the period and the colon. I have saved St. Nicholas till last, a patron saint of sailors, merchants, archers, repentant thieves, children, brewers, pawnbrokers and students. What's that got to do with Christmas? His 6th of December death date, he threw money through a window, landed on the shoes, the family shoes that were drying by the fire, and they found a little treat in the morning. He did many kind and generous deeds in secret, expecting nothing in return. Patron saint of voyagers and sailors as well saving many people from famine. It is the time of pagan midwinter feasts. He spared the lives of those innocently accused. Turkish-born. I don't know that's why. if that's why we have turkeys at Christmas. He did get put in jail at one point by the Romans uh, on a pilgrimage sailing to the Holy Land. He got some sailors to chill out in a tempest. OK, really, the last one, St Matthias, patron saint of addiction. The Holy Spirit will empower people to exercise self-control so that they have good health. No, right, really the last one. A monk from Gaza travelled to Alexandria. Does everyone know where Gaza is? He got the name and address of every prostitute in the city of Alexandria. He hired himself out as a day labourer and took his wage to one of these women at the end of the day. He would hire the woman for the night and, according to legend, spend the night praying for her or preaching to her. This practice was condoned by the church and many prostitutes in the city abandoned their profession and became wives and mothers. St Vitalis of Gaza 
St Vitalis was killed by a man who misunderstood the nature of the monk's visit to a brothel and struck him on the head. He managed to return to his monastic hut. Large numbers of prostitutes of the city came out to explain his works and walked in candlelit procession with lanterns as his body was brought to the grave. Venerable Vitalis of Gaza. Big in the Oriental Orthodox Church. But things would be amiss if there's the process that I've gone into before with Bepe, B apostrophe P H, if you want to read about it. Eight days after the birth of Jesus, he would have been Jewish, wouldn't he? The yard was chopped off. Joseph is most likely to have sliced off the foreskin and stopped the blood flow. Perhaps that's what the three kings descended on the stable for, to stop the blood flow from the little member of the Son of God. Such a thing might bring people out of the woodwork, wouldn't it? At the turn of the century, in 1900, before the First World War, the Catholic Church again tried to discourage circumcision. Europe isn't the Middle East or Africa climate. The small town north of Rome, on New Year's Day, the 1st of January, would march around the town, the priests proudly holding aloft Jesus' foreskin relic. But you're not allowed to write about it, you'll be excommunicated. For the Feast of the Holy Circumcision, I'm not sure what you're supposed to eat. I don't know if it's sausages or what. Chipolatas? But 1983, it got stolen. Don't know if it went back to the church, whether it went to whatever the local mafia near Rome called the forgotten. Satanists, perhaps it was them. In the Middle Ages, a dozen churches across Western Europe claimed to have the holy foreskin. That's enough for all the disciples put together. Did they all donate to spread the word? Memorabilia has to be signed and authenticated. In 800, Charlemagne, the French fella, king, unifier, crusader, presented the little bit of vellum and a little splinter from the cross to the Pope to help for better communing with the divine. They are incorruptible by natural decay. If you're fully committed to understanding God on earth in fully human form, the lack of sanctity of the little PP is part of it. There is, of course, the breast milk of the Virgin Mary. St. Catherine of Siena, the mystic marriage. It's been painted by Giovanni de Palio in 1460. St. Catherine of Siena had a vision that she was married to Jesus Christ and his foreskin served as the wedding ring. St. Catherine, really? Dreams of marriage suggest there were dreams of consummation as well. Nuns, what you like? <laughs> Lyon, mid-France since 2018, Lyon, Greater Lyon, has been France's second city, after Paris. Overtaking, do you say, Marseille, two and a half million population, Greater Lyon, and a million city centre, as such. For the most part, I know it's a sprawling mass of shopping warehouses, like St. Priest area. So I went to have a closer look, and it's nice. In Roman times, Lyon was named after the Celtic god Lug, who represented oaths, truth and law, and craftsmanship of many different skills. It's now a centre for Interpol, as amongst other things, and historically has been a centre for silk weaving. In Roman times, Lug, Lyon, was the centre for the Three Gauls. Now, where the Three Gauls were, it's a bit difficult to describe because there seems to be four or five of them. But essentially it's France, and then there's Belgium and a bit of Germany, and then there's also a chunk of Spain. I don't think they'd included Britain and Ireland at this time. The Romans had just expanded out of Italy, and France, Provence area, was the first... Provence was the first province after the Alps, basically. And while Lyon isn't in Provence by any stretch of the imagination, it's been Burgundy most of the time, but not part of Burgundy now. It was towards the centre of Gaulish France and the furthest extremity of the Roman province of Provence. A river confluence and a good position for roads. Essentially a frontier fort, well situated for the inevitable conquest of the rest of Gaul. Lyon is about two thirds to a half of the way down the hexagon of France, to the east, towards the east, on the Rhone River, at the confluence with the Saone River, which leads off to the Isère, 
the river that flows down from the Alps, where I've driven from along the parallel road. There's also a parallel road that drives south from Lyon to the coast, the Côte d'Azur, the Mediterranean. A drive which should take you about two and a half hours. And to the north, it's about four and a half hours to Paris. If you're tiring, Auxerre makes a very nice stop indeed, especially if you're fond of Chablis white wine. But a drive from Lyon to Paris takes you through the empty heart of agricultural France. All agriculture is highly mechanised. This is especially true if you avoid the Lyon-Dijon Côte d'Or winemaking region. Wait, so Burgundy even works, but we are going in the way on the back as its own winery, it's very much so. To the north, Macon, not so much, but to the south, just an hour south, just that bit more than a day trip perhaps, there's the Hermitage, Grey Perrier Tain, just north of Valence, slightly southwest of Lyon, there's the Pilate Mountains and Forests that lead you to St. Etienne, which to me is a band, but a lovely place. The Pilat Mountains and Forests, where you can get Hors Cadre, out of frame, relaxing and thinking outside the box. But we're exploring Old Town Lyon, the second city of France. The pretender to the throne is the second in line, and the brother of Louis, the Sun King of France, tended to be known as the Dauphin, the Dolphin. Lyon has its symbol as the Dolphin. The heir to the throne is known that because of a deal that was struck in the times of the Crusades, medieval Crusades. There was a feudal fiefdom nestled somewhere between Savoy and Provence. Had a dolphin on its coat of arms, they swim up the River Rhone from the Mediterranean. Perhaps romantically, they used to follow the Greek traders in their galleys. And there have been bronze sculptures found in the river near Vienne. Very attractive town. Easy day trip from Lyon. But though my fiefdom is dead and no more, the heir to the throne will always be named after me. And mine, a quantum of solace consolation. That bite out of the south of France coast is known as the Gulf of Lyon. It's just a way to find Marseille and the River Rhone as a route to the food capital of France. Provence and languedoc Roussillon separating you from the Catalans of Iberia. That bite may go some way to suggest why the most sunlight hours you can get as far north is Monaco, microclimate, the bump after the bite. Vieux Lyon, old Lyon, is mainly a renaissance city, with some medieval parts to be found. You can wander and discover the traboules, the narrow passageways, an incontournable not to be missed at right angles to the zone. And as you walk down the main shopping streets, give you fascinating glimpses towards, varied glimpses towards the hill, that you really should climb to see the cathedral, especially for a romantic evening. The cathedral is like a wedding cake, basically, a very ornate icing wedding cake. And inside, modern mosaics. When I say modern, not Roman, more arts and crafts, period. Fin de siècle, I'd place them as. If you get the opportunity, venture in through one of those many big, huge old doors, double doors, and um, have a look around the courtyards inside. Buildings needed to both shade you and shelter you from the heat and from the cold, and provide security in this transient confluence of rivers. While it's the f ingredients, the food, the wine, the restaurants, the cafes, that you perhaps really want to come to Lyon for, I'm going to digress back to that tenuous link of the Dauphine, the heir, and the spare, and all that nonsense. Inheritance. The laws of the ancient regime. Before the revolution were the basis of new France law, and especially Louisiana now. As a state, you're not allowed to disinherit your own children. Forced inheritance. I don't visit them, really, but as you drive around France, you see meuble shops, and you get immobilier versions of this throughout Europe. This is the movable things, like furniture, and the 
non-movable things, the immovable things, like property, house, using a looser term of property. Property first goes to a spouse, then to children, and then to their descendants, you would often think. In French law, the current French law, you descendants then pay the most inheritance tax. Traditionally in France and most of Europe, I'd say, Catholic Europe anyway, the son or the sons would inherit the property and the daughter or daughters would inherit the movable things inside the house. I know, I know which I'd prefer, you're thinking. There is a general non-French specific statistic that says that any inheritance will be lost within two generations. And while pessimistic, this is largely true for a large percentage of the population. Huge percentage of the population. Of course, a huge percentage of the population doesn't inherit anything. <laughs> Bourgeois capitalism reproduces and reinforces social class inequality on a national and international scale. On a personal level, life based on the formation of mutual admiration and a desire for the other to become strong and pure, the feelings of his or her life partner in their hearts can still result as a byproduct accumulation of some property through their own hard work and labours, so long as the acquisition of that property didn't involve hurting or depriving anyone else, which is rather difficult if you think about it. All investment hurts someone, doesn't it? Exploits, I should be included exploits in there. Difficult but allowable. This is the Marxist way of looking at things. And with inheritance tax, all governments are heading this way, you'll say, because it should really default to the state. Much the same as if you died intestate. I do find the Marxist view quite commendable and Christian, really. I have received a very strange letter through the post that's got nothing to do with me at all. Translations can be really flowery sometimes, especially when the French being reverential. In France, in, on all official forms, you put your family name first and your first name second. Through the post, I've received a letter for a woman. Her surname is the same as my mother's first name. I'd seen it's from the cemetery service and stamped all over the envelope even. I naturally thought that my mother had died and my brother hadn't bothered to tell me, which doesn't seem unlikely. A right of burial. Our records show that you are the registered owner of the right of burial in the above-mentioned grave. I am writing to advise you the period has now expired. Therefore, please let us know if you would like to renew. Now, I have to wonder, are they writing to a relative, a living relative, or are they writing to the dead person's last known address? For your information, the current cost of renewing the right of burial for an additional period of 25 years is £461, which can be paid by card over the phone or a cheque made payable to the council, the department, the prefecture, and with absolute efficiency and no further embellishments. If there is a memorial, it is advisable that you renew, as you are responsible for this. Once the period expires, the council cannot be obliged to contact relatives and can exercise the right to make safe any memorial that could pose a danger to the cemetery users. In some cases this could mean removal. If you wish to renew, please complete the attached form. Now the aforementioned got me thinking, but it does say only lawn type headstones and vases are permitted on grave spaces. £500 for 25 years. I could build a mausoleum and live in it. Off grid with solar and lithium batteries. Super insulated, of course, because you don't want it to get too cold and get a chill to your bones. My apologies, but this is a sort of a gallows humour. Pessimism is the realism. as a way of dealing with a type of stress. My mother is gravely ill with a, something similar to Parkinson's, which they won't diagnose or treat, partly because she recovered from cancer and partly for financial reasons in a home, depending what the home think of you. They can charge more or less to you personally, but... Um, we won't be getting any inheritance, put it that way.
sides of both men. I just hit it out in Beijing pants, then from kitchen man. Look at the seed patch on the fucker, old man and his brother setting about. Like porn up sticking constantly, Wi Fi's gone all low fight. My French inheritance tax laws can be both complex and rigid. Is it possible to marry a dead person? Posthumous marriage in France is legal but must be approved by several civil servants and the family of the deceased. France is one of the few countries in which it is legal to marry a partner posthumously after they've passed. However, children inherit in France. Uh, it's difficult for a partner to inherit and they won't inherit much. It's limited. If your parents are still with you, they won't get anything. The French government will try and grab all of your international assets for your children, a forced airship. Not those flying Zeppelin things. But your spouse can inherit the entire estate. If there's no children, it's father, mother, brother, sister. A common format for gifting property in France is for the donor to retain a life interest, a usufruit, in the property. Since the usufruit is a value attributed to it, the value is deducted from the gift to the children when they receive the remainder interest, the du propriété. A deceased spouse can sort of expect a quarter. But in France, again, one of the few places where the notary, the solicitor, will need quite a lot of handwriting on the will. You can understand it's more difficult to fake. Yes, debts do pass on, but they're sort of limited to the amount of the estate. Especially after Brexit, and even before, it is possible to end up being liable for double taxation. Children from a previous relationship is the main reason why you only get a quarter. But one of the most interesting things about French tax, really, rather than inheritance, is that every 15 years or so, there's like a rolling process that you can gift £100,000 to each of your children. So if you're a Jewish person living in France and you've got a big repopulating family, you can gift... 10 times £100,000 every 15 years, if I'm being a bit ridiculous here, but you get what I mean. It's all the same if they're male or female children. But who's got 10 children and who's got a million pounds every 15 years? Being resident in France uh, changes things slightly to if you just croak it as a tourist. But because of Brexit, I'm going to pause it here because it's all going to turn to, into a time of writing. Crash landed about a week ago. I had a slightly social interaction with the customs official as I was travelling over the channel. He was just changing. It was the switchover between two individuals. And I don't know, I felt the need to say, and at least you don't have a float to cash up. It won't take that long. Float being a bit of a pun, I suppose, seeing as I'm going on a cross-channel ferry. But he was saying how all the customs officers have had to sell up their places in France that they've bought and move back to England. It's just part of their job description, basically. <laughs> I didn't think much of it at the time, but the longer I drove around, it, I started to frown, actually.
inheritance, as dry as bilio as a subject until it's not. But it is for because it's never gonna happen, it's like talking about something that's someone else's rivalry. Perhaps the rake chooses their course because they don't want to be like their miser parent, but they inherit just the same. Now that stereotype isn't what feeds the 1% of the 1% for the 1%, I think I've misquoted that, by the... Anyway, I think we're allowed to say the 1% rather than plutocracy. Inequality of wealth well beyond the social advantage, social class, wealth distribution, cultural capital, linguistic styles, higher status social circles and aesthetic preferences, nurture or child rearing practices that go to create the social hierarchy that favours what goes into making you friends with that other person, like friends, as in life choices even? You famously don't have anything. But hey, they were in New York, so that economic mobility was always a possibility. Knowledge, skills and know-how. Education. Human capital. But as the 1% increases its stronghold, what we're not today calling a plutocracy, we have to be careful about talking about human capital. A um, signpost, a red flag. Zombie movies are a genre that have really taken hold. We are the zombies, and the plutocracy that we're not talking about is a plutocracy today, we're calling them the 1%. Or what Noam Chomsky and President Carter called the quarter of the top 1% in terms of wealth. Huge chunks of the population, the employed and the unemployed and the unemployable, start to look like slaves, or the unenslavable, especially to those that grew up in substantial privilege. Wealth inequalities mean that your country may be comparable with Jordan or Bosnia. High mortality rates and inaffordable healthcare, disease, obesity, diabetes and hypertension, Marxist theory of labour value, and even the Russian Revolution allowed some exceptions where others weren't exploited. I will delve into all the different sociological and anthropological terms of heirs apparent and heirs presumptive and co -parsony. But I'm trying to make this accessible and approachable. No, just we, before the dry gets even worse, we're going to be delving off into ancient Egypt and the source of Jewish inheritance laws. There's a link there, actually, with the lawyer doing it for the money professional. Nowadays, you can leave your money to whoever you like. Really. Uh -huh. There's a name for that, but escrow extends it further, a further level of control. You're dead, but you're still controlling your descendants. You put conditions. So you only inherit if you have children. You only inherit if you're married. You know the type of thing, but you can squirrel that down to, if you say please, I'm sure. Only if you have full bepe circumcision for your children. Don't know. But that seems to be the modern way that is given the excluder. Or if it helps women be provided for more, because you can do as you please, and it's respected. But women are provided for equally in law. If the Jewish female bloodline behaves itself and turns a blind eye and produces enough heirs, one of theirs, one of their male descendants, may be the beneficiary of that family industry. Be that what it may. You may have flooded the flesh pots of Venice or furnished the Habsburg Empire with your own yids from Poland that you educated and added value. Or perhaps it was just a less tenuous Washington political posture or health monopoly or just a straightforward investment hedge fund. The firstborn is everything and protecting the firstborn is everything. The firstborn gets twice as much as all the other sons put together, and if the oldest surviving son isn't the firstborn, they're not going to get that advantage. So there's no advantage to the second son bumping off the first son, because they got that voice telling them to. Abraham's voice. Perhaps Abraham's voice didn't want that family to have clear escrow. So if the there's ten children. The firstborn son gets half of everything, and the other nine, the other half, is divided between those nine, which wouldn't amount to quite so much if it was my family anyway. I have to ask, though, on the east coast of America, does the firstborn son get double portions of every meal? Are they the most obese of the lot? Perhaps you could leave your... No, don't leave any comments. 
know from studying the scrolls. Yeah, of course. What is? If there were no living sons and no descendants of any previous living sons, daughters inherit. Brothers inherit if there's no daughters, and sisters inherit if there's no sons. You can understand how there's going to be lots of spares in Poland for the um, Habsburg Portuguese Dutch to make the most of. And if you're a Jewish person in the Christian world, historically, you could still keep in contact with your Jewish brethren in the Arab world, where there was no contact otherwise. I don't know what the going rate might have been. One white woman slave for ten. One Christian country Jewish girl for ten Arab country Jewish girls, possibly. For some context, please see the Paris video. Anywho, if her daughter inherits and then marries a man not from her paternal tribe, her land will pass from the birth tribe's inheritance into her marriage tribes, obviously, to the man. These are the tribes of Israel, let's remember. However, if her daughter inherits land, she must marry someone within her father's tribe, like the sons of their father's brothers. How you and uh, they made them do that isn't too clear, but really poor education makes a mockery of choice, and honour killings would have never been very far away. I need to know whether ultra-Zionists still apply such ideals, whether the propagandised girls buy into it. The double portion for the firstborn son, though. What if they've... Well, perhaps it's young sperm and they haven't inherited bad traits. Perhaps the oldest is always going to be more traditional because they're older. The firstborn of a new family, that's a whole different ball game these days. But the temptation for subsequent sons to exploit the females must have been huge. And when so much more prevalent at the end of the 1800s, when such terms as anti-Semitism and that terminology that we're representing now as the 1% of the 1% of the 1% came into being. Arabs didn't really figure on the horizon any more than Jewish people did, and the unfortunate poor of both were sort of patronised, whereas the wealthy were one of us. But this was the time of entomology and anthropometrics and how you could tell what criminal did for a living by the way they looked and their head measurements. This turned into post-World War Aryan ideologies and the worst of what was to come. We don't have so many Jewish people in Europe anymore. The east coast of America has done so much to repopulate birth rates so ethnographically higher than, well, much the same as they might have always been in Poland, that perhaps fueled the sense of being threatened that all suffered as a result of. Much of that tribe's master tribe moved to Israel and they've kept that level of subordination. But in terms of inheritance, we've almost come full circle to back to the Roman system that got left behind with Christianity. Promogeniture. Romans used to adopt a lot. Um, children were often blooming ungrateful and privileged beyond belief. Much the same as now, they might not be having children because of their indulgences. I don't want to go further on that one. So Romans used to adopt a lot. They had their slaves. Their favourite slave used to do so much for them and they're so pleased with them. They can have everything. So Roman law was much like escrow now, where you can leave anything to anyone, pretty much. With few social or judgmental constraints. Protestant medieval times particularly wanted to avoid subdivision of inherited property, but the laws and what actually happened were often quite different. They were a minority and wanted to survive, but their doctrine of hard work and trying not to exploit others didn't generate huge amounts of income anyway. The Quran for Islamic peoples greatly improved the rights of women in comparison to pre-Islamic Semitic inheritance laws. Women should be looked after, so a son would have twice as much inheritance as a daughter. But that's still much more. A business given to a 
son, the most able son. We're talking about inequality of inheritance here, most generally. A thriving multi-billion dollar industry, a business. Yet the daughter is given a balance of the actual inheritance, amounting to far less than the value of the business that is given to the son. It's a bit like the son gets all the working capital and then the daughter gets the 10%. Taxes and government wealth confiscation and redistribution are growing in Britain after the Second World War in order to pay the Marshall Plan, the huge debt that American war profiteers of the east coast of America brought to Britain. The landed estates, the stately homes of the landed gentry, had to be taxed at 90%. And many, while it's the nation's cultural heritage, many just tore down their own homes rather than pay. And as architectural salvage, many Americans then bought the stones. Baby boomers are supposed to have had a substantial head start. Social and class stratification have followed from that lead. All the prejudices that existed at that time have been reinforced and on a smaller scale has turned into its own type of dynastic wealth. No, just like the Romans, people do still marry people that they have a hold over, that there aren't their equals, but people do tend to marry within their socio-economic circles. Hunter-gatherers, where might is right, didn't have the pastoral land to inherit. Primogeniture predominates, though ultimogeniture, the inheritance by the most loved, the youngest, isn't unheard of. Particularly with the Greeks, they like their Olympics, and the youngest tend to do best at running races and things like that. And that was a way of choosing a partner. Succession of the youngest and the fittest. You can understand it, can't you? Saxon England, before the Normans invaded those proto-Vikings, was predominantly ultimogeniture. Borough English, English boroughs, as they was known the youngest surviving male child, presumably. A lot of the older male childs had already <coughs> martyred themselves for Papa in battles, maintaining the fiefdom or the throne. Soakmen of Danelaw in northeast England, something like escrow really. It was where the more local law of sock and sack, that of local private justice, sort of overruled the national Norman justice, a true Viking thing the authority of the reeve at the hundred court, impinging on the royal. Soakmen weren't bonded tenants, their property amounted to up to 50% of the countryside, but they weren't serfs, slaves, either. Anywho, if you're the heir of a dolphin, make sure you get it in writing, and not handwriting, no countries these days except handwriting, and... A scrawled signature could be under duress, and everything might get turned upside down if you can afford a good legal professional, or otherwise. The law is for sale, typed and witnessed, and paid registered. Even if you get sold all up and given it out as cash, you're supposed to register it and have it taxed, but just not big sums. Liquidise your assets, get the state to pay for your care by being wise about the small print that no one wants to worry themselves about. If you've got a relative living in your home, a child or a person over 65, you won't be paying for your nursing home care. Now, Napoleonic law is different. Oh, you'll have to wait till another time for that one. <laughs>